Coding DX is proud to be supported by AMBOSS, a medical education platform with an expansive resource library and USMLE style question bank. Hello and welcome to Decoding Physiology from Decoding DX. I'm Brianna and today is part one of a two-part series about calcium alkali syndrome. So when you have a patient who comes to the emergency room to the clinic with calcium alkali syndrome, if they are symptomatic, then it'll be your classic hypercalcemia symptoms. They could have kidney stones, bone pain, nausea, vomiting, or some sort of headache or altered mental status. With calcium alkali syndrome, you can also have significant dehydration, acute kidney injury, and tingling, muscle twitches, or lightheadedness from the alkalosis itself. But most commonly in calcium alkali syndrome, the patient actually is asymptomatic, and it's an incidental finding on labs. These are the labs that you would expect. It'll be a hypercalcemia in the setting of a low PTH, so PTH-independent hypercalcemia, along with a metabolic alkalosis and some other electrolyte abnormalities. The key to the diagnosis of calcium alkali syndrome is the history. In the classic calcium alkali syndrome, you'll have excess antacid consumption, most typically Tums, calcium carbonate, things like that. But you also could have a patient with the perfect storm, meaning they have two separate processes that happen concurrently, causing a metabolic alkalosis and a hypercalcemia at the same time. And you'll see as we go on how this can create the calcium alkali syndrome. An example of this would be, let's say a cancer patient who has hypercalcemia from cancer metastases to the bones, and they also have nausea and vomiting from their chemo. They would have a metabolic alkalosis from the nausea and vomiting and hypercalcemia from the meds. So some basics of calcium absorption in the GI tract. These are our intestinal epithelium cells, and they are connected by tight junctions in between them. Most of the calcium absorption occurs via facilitated diffusion through the TRPV6 channel. There is some evidence that suggests there's also some active endocytosis and paracellular transport between the cells, but in typical cases, it's mostly through that TRPV6 channel. Once it's side, it binds to calbindin, which helps keep the concentration gradient for free calcium to flow into the cell. From there, it is transported to the basilar membrane, where it is exchanged with sodium and actively transported into the body. So to start off with calcium alkali syndrome, we have to create the problem to begin with. Too much calcium plus some sort of an alkaline substance. There are four major ways to increase GI calcium absorption. One of the major ways is by increasing the body's major regulator of calcium, vitamin D. Vitamin D increases the synthesis of those key transporter proteins that we talked about. So you're actually just increasing the amount of parallel processes that are bringing extra calcium in through that GI tract. However, the biggest perpetrator in calcium alkali syndrome is increased dietary intake, specifically with absorbable alkaline substances. Like I said earlier, biggest perpetrator here is simply Tums, calcium carbonate, but you can also have the situation where a patient is on calcium supplements and they're taking some other antacid like aluminum hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide, which is milk of magnesia. This increases the calcium and saturates the transporter proteins, and it also increases the paracellular absorption as well because it's even overwhelming those calcium transport mechanisms. Plus, you have that base there, that alkaline substance, that's also going to be absorbed. I won't go into the details of how that's absorbed, but if you have a ton of it there, more of it's going to be absorbed. Next up, we have to overwhelm the body's natural compensatory mechanisms. Through a negative feedback loop, hypercalcemia will decrease the amount of active vitamin D, otherwise called calcitriol. You're probably familiar with the process of where PTH, parathyroid hormone, tells the kidney to convert 25-OH vitamin D to 125-OH vitamin D, which is that activated version calcitriol. So if you stop the PTH by mechanisms of hypercalcemia causing negative feedback, you will then stop the production of active vitamin D. Thus, that will cause decreased absorption in the GI tracts because you'll have fewer of those absorption proteins in the epithelium. However, there is a problem with this as a compensatory mechanism, because if you simply have so much calcium that even if there are fewer channels transporting that calcium in through the GI tract, you're still going to get the paracellular absorption and you're still going to get too much calcium being absorbed. Another potential way where this breaks down is that in chronic kidney disease, sometimes we have to supplement activated vitamin D directly as calcitriol because if their kidneys aren't functioning, they can't activate the vitamin D themselves. And so if a patient is in a situation where they are being given activated vitamin D, then obviously this skirts around this compensatory mechanism. The second major compensatory mechanism is deposition of excess calcium into the bone. This works really well in kids. Kids have actively growing bones with net building at baseline, so this works great in them. We really don't ever see calcium alkali that often in kids. Plus, they're also not taking as much supplements like adults do. 
In younger adults, the bone changes are kind of at a net zero where they're not necessarily building, but they're not quite breaking down yet. And so they have a slower ability to buffer that calcium, but it's still there. In elderly adults, however, the net movement is calcium out of the bone as they're getting older and developing osteoporosis and osteopenia. So the bone has a significantly lower ability to buffer that calcium, and it's just simply not a good compensatory mechanism anymore. Lastly, if we create the problem, fail to fix the problem, there are lots of mechanisms that go into further exacerbating the problems that we see with calcium alkali syndrome that lead to the severe presentations that we see in the hospital. This is gonna be the entire topic of the next video. So hang in and watch that video after this one, which will come out a week later, and we'll go over each of these different mechanisms. So in a brief summary, we create the problem in calcium alkali syndrome by absorbing too much calcium and too much alkali. Most commonly, this happens in the setting of dyspepsia, leading to the patient to have too much antacid consumption. Then our bodies fail to fix the problem, which happens in two major mechanisms. We either overwhelm the body's compensatory mechanisms with simply so much calcium that it doesn't matter that we turn off the hormones, or it's in a patient whose bones are simply too old to compensate very well for that hypercalcemia. Lastly, there's gonna be many pathophysiological mechanisms that further worsen the problem and create severe cases that we'll see in the hospital. And that is what we will find out on the last episode. Here are some references. Thank you so much for joining us. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe. It really does help the channel. You can send us feedback at info at decodingdx.com and follow up next week for part two of this calcium alkali series. Now, a bit more about our sponsor, Hamboss. AMBOSS is a unique medical education platform that can help you learn at all stages of medical training. They help you study on all rotations and prepare you for all USMLE and NBME exams. The AMBOSS library is expansive with individual topic pages that are easy to navigate and full of features designed with the medical student in mind. Example radiology and pathology images feature overlays to clearly demonstrate pathology. Diagrams are one of a kind and the high yield feature allows you to focus in on what's most important. The question bank seamlessly integrates with the library and features in-depth explanations with quick links to definitions, topic pages, and outside sources. AMBOSS even has a mobile app that is highly functional and can access the content even without internet connection. And as an extra bonus, you can save, print, cut, copy, or paste anything while a test is active.